Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jacques Fuentes. I'm here to talk about uh, zombie apocalypse or epidemic gossip in Haskell. Um, kind of want to start off and say, you know, this isn't like um, anything new by any means. There's a company called HashiCore, which has a in-production system of epidemic gossip protocol. The specific one I'll be talking about today, which is called Swim. Uh, there are plenty of other companies which people in this room have worked at or work at now that have also worked on gossip protocols. Um, as far as I could tell, there are either none or very few in Haskell. So I thought it'd be fun to kind of tackle this, this problem. Um, before we kind of begin, jump into that, I want to start with some disclosures. Um, this is my first serious Haskell project. Uh, besides sort of reading books or kind of fiddling for small projects, I've never taken on anything kind of serious like this. Besides that, it's also my first uh, implementation of a distributed systems paper. I certainly enjoy reading them from time to time, learning as much as I possibly can. But I'm very much a newbie, so newbie to Haskell, newbie to distributed systems. Also, I should go ahead and let you know this is also my first conference talk. So I'm glad that. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually really excited that I get to do it here at MoonConf, that we have such an awesome audience, such an awesome congregation of people that are, I think, um, really open. And uh, I feel comfortable here. Let's leave it at that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the other thing, too. Um, at the bottom here, you may notice it says say the code is about 80% complete, but I think we all know what that actually means, right? It might mean I've got about a half a year before I'm done with my implementation. It is certainly open source work. No one's paying me for it, but uh, I think in seriousness, uh, I'll probably finish it up uh, hopefully within the next month. If anyone's looking to ha hack on Haskell or specifically this problem on Saturday, I will be around. So, um, I think with all of that kind of an aggregate, you should take everything I say today with a uh, grain of salt, right? So I probably don't really know what I'm talking about, but I'm trying <laughs> and, I, and I'm learning. Um, and so the other thing too we should, we should take note of is uh, I kind of just finished up this talk. <laughs> Stayed up really late last night and pulled it all together today. So uh, I think we're it's still nice and we're gonna have some fun today. Um, uh, before we go to the next slide though, I, I kind of want to say, I actually think like the, the way I actually think of this slide is sort of a preemptive sorry for not knowing everything. And that's actually meaningful to me because uh, I've, I've, I have a family, I have a wife, I have children, and I've noticed that, and my wife has noticed this, that women, usually we'll, we'll go with women here, say sorry much more frequently than men um, for really purposes that are unknown to me, right? So we, we see it all the time in my house. And I actually already see it in, in my uh, almost five-year-old daughter saying sorry for things that she, she didn't hurt anyone, she didn't do anything wrong really. Sorry because she came around a corner too fast. That's not acceptable in our house. So I'm trying to balance the scales by saying sorry more and suggesting to my wife and to my daughter that they don't say sorry unless they've actually hurt someone. And that's become a rule in our, in our, in our home. Um, not the rule that I have to say sorry, <laughs> unless you know, I've hurt someone. But uh, so with all that said, you know, I'm pulling this stuff together and trying to do what I can. And, and hopefully it works out. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I was staying up pretty late last night. And no excuses. It's really just kind of who I am as a person. So <laughs> uh, it's the truth of the matter. Sometimes I kind of take on too many things at once. I think I've been known to do that very frequently. Sometimes I procrastinate just like everybody else. Uh, sometimes I'm late because of no one's fault but my own. Um, missed a flight recently. Was very lucky that I actually got it rescheduled with no charges because I was nice to the person. She, she actually said, you were, you had a sense of humor and you weren't trying to climb to the desk and, and kill me, so I'm actually gonna let it go. Sweet. <laughs> so, um, okay, so straight up into gossip. This is one form of gossip. We've all been here, right? Everyone's been to the water cooler or sort of now the figurative water cooler, everyone's on Slack, hip chat, something, right? Now you have the water cooler at any moment in the day which is incredibly dangerous, I think. <laughs> um, 
You know, I've been here too, and I, I think I'm actually kind of surprised that I put smiley faces on these people because oftentimes the gossip at the water cooler is not so happy. Uh, it's usually maybe kind of spreading misinformation or talking poorly about someone else. I, I know I've done it my fair share. I, I'd really like to do less of it, and uh, I'm trying. Uh, you know, every day I try to work on becoming a better person. I think this is one, one area where we do more damage than we actually know. Um, but the other thing is that this kind of gossip is somewhat vaguely similar to the gossip protocols we'll be talking about today. Uh, you know, information and uh, a cluster of people or a group of people can spread sort of uh, exponentially very quickly, right? That information can propagate. Um, but I think there's, there's a much closer model than this sort of uh, gossip between human beings. Um, and in the distributed systems literature, it's really based off of these models. Um, sorry, before we jump to that too, I, I want to say that in these gossip models too, we'll be talking about SWIM specifically, but uh, I should point out that, again, there are a lot of databases that actually use gossip protocols. So React's one of them, Cassandra, uh, actually Akka, if anyone's ever used that, has a clustering system that also has gossip protocol. Redis cluster has a gossip protocol. Um, so, the model that's a little bit more accurate or, or maps better to uh, gossip protocols and distributed systems literature is one found in the scientific community. So there's this uh, model called SIR, and it's an epidemiological model to compute infection propagation in a population over time. And all that means is if you think of the flu, measles, or potentially if you've seen movies like Contagion or something else, you know, you have a deadly virus something deadly bacteria, something which might be able to spread uh, and obviously it could propagate through a, a community of human beings very quickly and depending on how violent that disease might be, we could die very rapidly, right? Or a lot of people get sick very rapidly. Um, you may have had a scare every once in a while on the news from these kind of things. So they actually have models where they have very, I'd say, very rigorous scientific and mathematic analysis of how these things propagate uh, and how they can try to stop them. And so we'll talk a little bit about how that kind of relates to the gossip protocol. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to add another I'm sorry here because I really wish I had added uh, a visualization of gossip, especially from, from the SIR model because uh, it's, it's just awesome. And I was hoping. Uh, again, taking on too many things at once is maybe trying to do that in Elm and, and load up the system and actually use Elm to get a sort of live understanding of the nodes and, and produce a visualization. That clearly didn't happen. So <laughs> the uh, SIR model will show you in a little bit how that it really uh, maps uh, almost perfectly to the SWIM gossip protocol. You have uh, susceptible, infected, and recovered, and I think those are pretty clear what happens there. Right? Susceptible means maybe you're not immunized, so uh, you can become infected. Uh, infected means in our zombie world, you are now a zombie. Uh, recovered, you, you know, maybe you've had uh, some help, some medical help. So where do the zombies come into play at this? Well, based on these, uh, these mathematical models for SIR, there have been recent publications. Oh, yeah, this is, this is not a joke. This is <laughs> these are real researchers who are doing mathematical models of, of outbreaks of zombies. Um, and this is the math they have done in here is a lot more complex than I saw in the, the basic SIR model. Um, they actually do, uh, I think, myriad evaluation of different variables. They change the models a little bit, including uh, accounting for uh, births of babies, et cetera, coming into the population because that can actually accelerate zombie infection. Um, it, it's really interesting read. You know, it was a little bit of a tangent for me, but it, it was fun. Um, and I think the, cool take, the coolest takeaway for me is if you are actually considering a PhD, you can, maybe if you're on the fence, you can, this is kind of cool stuff you can do. But the sad thing that they concluded in this, and this is why zombies are fun, is that we're basically gonna die if there's ever a zombie outbreak. It's likely to lead to the collapse of civilization. <laughs> unless it is dealt with quickly. And what they mean by quickly is uh, really, they say it here, hit hard and hit often. And what they mean is try to uh, really, I think, 
probably use weapons, whatever you possibly can, to rid the population of zombies as quickly as possible. Um, there was uh, another paper I read, it's not in here, but it was very interested in, and I think it went into even more detail. So this is not the only paper, by the way, and actual publication, I found at least two more, so there's three out there, probably more floating around. And one of them was suggesting that, uh, and this is probably obvious to most of us, that if you wanted to survive the zombie outbreak, the best thing you can do is find a rural area, somewhere in the country, right? Less densely populated, less zombies, hopefully. Uh, maybe you can survive for longer. Which is actually, to me, a pretty interesting sort of side note. Did anyone here ever watch The Walking Dead? Good. Okay, I got a few. Okay, sweet. So I'm not actually a huge zombie fan, and before I watched The Walking Dead, someone suggested that I do it, and uh, you know, I met that suggestion with pretty sincere or serious skepticism. I, I don't know how you could actually watch a couple seasons of just zombies roaming around, uh, but it turns out it really wasn't about the zombies, right? It was about the outbreak and how humanity deals with that, and. How do you think humanity dealt with it? To no, poorly, right? To no one's surprise, right? The, the worst aspects, the darkest moments of humanity is revealed in the show. Uh, and it's actually an interesting thing because in these papers, in the scientific papers, they don't account for the fact that human beings will probably start murdering each other, which then actually accelerates the outbreak, right? Uh, and that's actually what happens in, in The Walking Dead. And uh, it's, it's kind of sad, but an interesting story nonetheless. So, Again, the conclusion from The Walking Dead and from this, this mathematical analysis is zombie outbreak means we're all dead. So we can go, go ahead and move on to swim. So that's a lot of words <laughs> on the top, but uh, it's scalable, weakly consistent. Scalable, I think we all know what that means at this point. We're talking about maybe going from a three node cluster to potentially a thousand, uh, more than that. Uh, more modern gossip protocols can uh, scale to much larger clusters as well. Uh, weakly consistent, I think we under, hopefully a lot of people understand what that means in the distributed systems uh, sense, right? Uh, infection style is this sense of epidemic, again, the SIR model. The, these are epidemics that we're talking about, so an infection is an epidemic outbreak. Uh, so gossip in the SWIM model, uh, information can spread in a cluster of nodes and an infection style manner. And the membership just means that really one of the primary purposes of SWIM is just understanding who all is within a cluster, who all is alive within a cluster, who all have we recently seen leave the cluster, uh, who all is potentially dead and might leave the cluster. Um, there are, ooh, got some, yeah. So there's some interesting properties of SWIM. Uh, this paper is kind of old. I actually still don't know the date. I think it's probably 10 years old or so, but um, something interesting that they offer is a sort of a constant message load per member. So that's really important because it means we're reducing the, the load on the network, right? Uh, we also have a deterministic bound. Uh, that's a time bound, which is just a function of the length of members to detect failure, which is that's also a very nice property of the system. It means we have uh, a rigorous way to say we should know by time t when we should be able to detect a failed node. Uh, and then also there's the epidemic propagation, the fact that disseminating information, so if a node falls out of the cluster because it's dead um, or became a zombie, then we can disseminate that information and the latency just grows logarithmically. Uh, that's, that's obviously another very nice property and I'll show you why in a second. Um, but the other thing that I talked about before, which is this SIR model, again, mapping, mapping to the SWIM model, um, it's no surprise, right? Again, what they were doing is they're taking the literature, even before this paper, they're taking the SIR literature and they were using that as sort of the foundation for gossip protocols as a, as a means to uh, analyze the properties of a system uh, and a cluster in production. So what gossip, or so what SWIM, wants to try and avoid in the old style heart uh, gossip protocol systems is they were doing end-to-end -end heart beating, which means that uh, for some of those systems, every node would try to speak to every other node. Uh, once you grow that to scale, that's a huge problem, right? Uh, I think we can all imagine sort of what that looks like. We went from a three node cluster, right, to a five node cluster here. 
There are a lot more arrows. That's all you need to know, right? A lot more arrows. So what this means is the, the, the growth uh, is, is actually quadratic. It's not web scale, right? This is more Raffle web scale. Um, and it, it can, honestly, it could bring down networks, right? Your network administrator, your network engineers, frankly, they would not like you at all. So this is why we don't do this. Again, this is old style. None of the new <coughs> protocols really do this. Um, so in SWIM, though, we have uh, the basic, basic kind of idea of a ping and an ACK, right? We want to know if another node is alive. And this is the very first basic introduction. Uh, we're seeing time kind of flows down. So at the top, we have A pings B. Some time proceeds, and then B sends an ACK back to A. A just wants to know, hey, are you alive? B says, sure, I am. Um, this is the best possible world, that this would just happen all day long, right? But it turns out no, no real production system is the best possible world, right? What happens in distributed systems? They fail in, in various myriad ways, right? We have network partitions, which some people like to believe don't happen, um, <laughs> but you know, there's plenty of evidence that they do. Uh, and so what we're seeing here in network partition is you've got uh, a large side of the cluster on the left. Uh, they can no longer communicate with the right-hand side. Uh, so what happens? They actually think the, the nodes on the right-hand side are dead, right? So that's a problem. Uh, another problem here is when a node potentially is actually dead, or maybe it's going through a long uh, garbage collection cycle, or maybe someone restarted the process or restarted the VM or the machine, uh, and it'll come back up in a few minutes. Um, what SWIM wants to do is try to get around some of these problems, and we'll, we'll go into that in a second. But um, the thing that we'll talk about too is uh, you know, how this information propagates. And I think the thing to take away here is uh, we've got a dead node here. So that's our zombie node. And this is what can happen again in the zombie world. Everyone you know is dead. The cat says it's good, no matter. So in SWIM, it's kind of, uh, it's really split into three components. There's actually a basic SWIM approach that they put forth in the, uh, in the paper, which then they go on to build on top of in a more complex manner. Uh, no one would really do the basic one because it doesn't offer all the guarantees that I talked about. But the more complex one really has three components. It has a failure detector. Uh, it's just a, a means of determining if a node is alive or if we suspect that it's going to die or is dead and if it actually is dead. Um, that, and that, sus that suspect thing is suspicion mechanism. And that's an important thing too. It's a, it plays into some guarantees that it offers. Um, this is what the failure detector looks like. I, I hope this is understandable because the, the paper actually I don't know that it's, this is, I think this is clear. But again, we're back to time is flowing down, right? Uh, and we have A trying to ping node B. And that block there just means that we can't get to it for whatever reason. Uh, so what it really means is B never received a ping, or it may just mean that we didn't get an act from B. Let's just say we didn't communicate with it. So on the next level, what we do, if we've determined that we couldn't connect uh, or we couldn't get an act back from A after a timeout, which might be one, two seconds, uh, it's actually configurable, then what A will do is send out what's the next message called indirect ping. It tries to go around uh, to nodes that it knows about and see if those can connect to B. And what those will do, and it chooses K, uh, K nodes randomly, and all of those will ping B. So let's say it chooses three nodes at random. They will all ping B. Maybe two of them also can't reach B for various reasons. Let's say in our example, B was actually going through a, a long GC pi, uh, cycle, and D was the slowest to get to that ping, uh, and it finally responded. So, and the next one at the bottom, B uh, is acting back to D, and D just kind of routes that right back to A. So ACK of B goes to A, and A says, oh, so B is okay, as far as I know, for now. That's, uh, this is the failure detection. This is happening on, uh, on a cycle, right, on a loop. It's every, it is a tick. Again, it's configurable, probably 100, 200 milliseconds. Um, and actually what it does in the top, instead of just pinging one node, it'll choose uh, also K random uh, members from, from the cluster. And the failure detector, there's this next step, which is the suspicion mechanism. Uh, in the case that 
This is still the example from before. We couldn't get to B in the, in the first time slice. We send an indirect ping. None of those nodes could get to B, because in this case, B is actually dead. B is a zombie. Um, then A is going to get timeout for E, C, and D. Those pings, will, all of those will time out. We'll never get an act back from any of them. And so we're going to now say that B is suspect. And we send that on through the, the dissemination component. And what that will do is it will gossip to other members that B is suspect. And then they can then try to ping them. Um, and eventually, this node, if it really is dead, will be eliminated from, from the entire cluster. Um, so if you see here at the bottom on the, on the right, um, so they mark B as dead if no member ever refutes that B is actually alive. So uh, in the case that it did come back online, then it, it would send out an alive message. Some node would send that back to A, and then we wouldn't remove it from our member list. Um, and this is, so this is how the gossip protocol works. That dissemination piece is very important. That's that epidemic propagation. Um, this, is, this is our similarity to zombies and in, in how they, again, propagate. <laughs> this is the best one I, I found, by the way, the zombie picture. <laughs> um, so dissemination, though, I think we should probably go a little bit deeper into that. And then finally, we'll actually talk a little bit about Haskell. Um, so there's the failure detector that we just talked about that will send a message to the disseminator. Uh, the disseminator is really just sort of this priority queue. That, so it receives kind of messages internal to its process that's saying the failure detector noticed that uh, B is suspect or B is dead. Uh, then we tell the disseminator in, in our running process, hey, add this to your priority queue. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be the highest priority right now because new messages are highest priority. Um, and what happens with that, though, is inside of this priority queue, the alive, dead, and suspect messages, they all get enqueued for piggybacking. The pings, act, and indirect pings, those are the ones that get sent out immediately. So if I say I'm doing my uh, failure detector uh, loop, I'm going to sing, send out pings. Again, that's going to happen potentially every 100, 200 milliseconds, right? So we know these messages will get sent out. Just because we enqueued them, we know they, they will get sent out, unless we have zero members in our cluster. That's a different problem. Um, so the important bit here is, again, what we take is a batch of messages. Uh, and it's actually, this is a really important concept here in SWIM, because since these messages get piggybacked, it, it means that this was a, the constraint that we made or the um, guarantee we made for message load in the system. This is, this is how we achieve that. This is how we keep it very low, and we keep network congestion low, and our network administrators, our network engineers love us. Um, so that's kind of your, our walkthrough for uh, SWIM. So we get to Haskell a little bit. So I have a good chunk of the system done. 80% was probably pulled out of my ass, so <laughs> uh, it might even be a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. But let's talk about concurrency, because that's clearly one of the most important parts here in, um, um, in, in the system, right? We have Haskell has an M to N scheduler. Uh, it has STM, which is software transactional memory. It has channels. Uh, if anyone's ever done any Go programming, uh, it's very similar to that. Uh, there are also channels in other languages. And Conduit is something that's a, a package. Most of these other things are packages, too. I mean, the, and Scheduler is actually built in, obviously, to the platform. But Conduit is a streams library, which is really helpful. And we'll break down all these in a second. Uh, again, the M to N scheduler is kind of green threads. You'll find this in other languages, other platforms, Erlang, Go, uh, a number of other systems. Uh, and it's really, really important because it means that we have sort of high scalability, especially when we're doing a lot of I.O. or non-blocking I.O. because we can launch these green threads. There are many, and they get mapped to one OS thread, and the OS takes care of scheduling the OS threads for us. Um, but those uh, green threads are, are very lightweight. They're not as heavy as the, the larger system threads. And uh, it means that we can launch you know, tens of thousands of them in, in Haskell and, and communicate effectively still over channels. Um, and this bottom here, this type of signature, this is really how we kind of create one of these lightweight threads, is fork IO. Um, I'm going to avoid talking about IO today in <laughs> Haskell. I'm not going to talk about monads. I'm not really going to talk about 
the IO monad. Uh, we'll just talk, we'll just say, you know, concurrency in general, how these things communicate. Um, but I, I will say one important property here that you get in uh, Haskell is you get this thread ID, right? Uh, kind of similar to something you get in, in, in Erlang, right? Means you have control. And Go, you don't have control. You launch a Go routine and you say go do something, you have no control over that, you can't go kill that. You have to go send it a channel to tell it to quit if you want to do that. So you have to potentially send it two channels for communication. Um, STM is software transactional memory. Be very careful with this, you know, almost equals here on the right hand side. These are very loose approximations, they're not correct. It is not, uh, there should be another C there, sir. That's the, this is not Rails MVC, <laughs> that's MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which is uh, Postgres uses that to do its transactions. A number of other databases use it too. Um, you can think of it like a database transaction. Uh, and it's very, very important in Haskell because we have purity, immutability. Uh, STM comes in very handy since most of our system might be immutable. Uh, we're not actually doing mutation. We can still use STM. We can use these T vars, and A here is uh, a type variable, so it's generic. We can kind of we could put a list in there. We could put a map in there. We could put an integer in there, a string. Um, it's really important because you, you can think of it again, sort of like a database database transaction. If we wanted to change something, that was a good <laughs> that's a good brain stuff. Um, I, uh, this is another one where I wish I had more uh, illustrations, but um, STM is awesome. Uh, Try it a little bit quicker. So channels in Haskell, um, the, these again are sort of kind of similar to Go. Uh, you can create these channels and then you can hand them off to the fork IO that you made. So these other running uh, lightweight threads are green threads. And this is how you would communicate between them. You can use STM and you can use channels. So I can launch a couple of green threads, dupe a channel or give them all the same channel uh, and then send them information over that channel and they can just kind of do blocking reads on those to get updates. Um, it comes in very handy, especially in this kind of system. And you can think of it sort of at the bottom, what happens is we can write to a channel, it goes through a pipe uh, and then something on the other end is like reading that. It's kind of like a Unix pipes a little bit. Um, very critical. Uh, one thing to note too, these are built on top of STM. That's why STM is awesome. So Conduit is a streaming library. Uh, it, it gives some, some nice properties like constant memory. So we can stream files, we can stream uh, you know, network sockets, other things, and we can, we can try to approximate sort of constant memory. Uh, it also has some other things like uh, taking care of uh, errors and recovery, et cetera, which is why I've used it in this system. Uh, it's again, it's an approximation of sort of these pipelines here. You have a producer who produces something, and on the other end, you consume something. That's the same thing as a server listening on a socket. Uh, that's kind of producing a message, and then we can have something reading it on the other end. Ooh, I don't know if we'll get to much of the Haskell here. So I'll breeze through this one. <laughs> this is approximately what the system looks like in Haskell. We kind of already saw the failure detector. We saw the disseminator, priority queue, the piggybacking. Um, up in the uh, upper right here, we have our UDP listener. So we have a UDP socket that's bound. This is trying to get incoming messages from the other nodes. Uh, then there's like a message processor that knows how to deal with certain message types. Um, and that might send it over a channel to the ACK handler, which is waiting for ACKs to let a green thread know, hey, we received an ACK. Um, and those could be callback functions, yep, even in Haskell. Um, and the other thing the message processor will do is maybe send a message to the disseminator. So if the, we got a, uh, a ping over the UDP listener, we're gonna send that node an act back. So we'll send that to the disseminator and the disseminator will send that out. Um, some gripes, I kinda wanted to talk about some fun things of Haskell, but <laughs> clearly I'm running out of time. So I'll go with gripes first. Um, I, I would have loved to show more code today, but I didn't state in the beginning, one of the things that kind of compelled me to kind of do this was, uh, maybe I did talk about it, that someone suggested that there weren't a lot of distrib distributed systems, hey, go build one. So I said, okay, I guess I'll go do that uh, and I'll learn. Uh, I've learned a lot, um, but I've also learned that there are some serious problems sort of building these kind of systems in, in Haskell. Uh, problems that you might not have elsewhere. So we get all the benefits of Haskell, we get sort of the immutability, we get purity, referential transparency, we get uh, an expressive type system. Uh, we get a lot of awesome things, but I don't know yet, and this is me as a novice speaking, that it's worth the cost for some of these other things. Uh, but at the same time, I haven't done enough. 
So I know there are some problems. It's very hard to kind of reason about what the performance in this kind of system will look like. Uh, you can use some things like called bang patterns, which is starting to force evaluation of expressions um, or kind of fighting the, the laziness of Haskell. Um, byte strings are things that we're dealing with because we're communicating over network sockets. So you have lazy byte strings, you have eager byte strings, you can force those evaluations. Uh, and then you have things that are space leaks in Haskell too. And so all, all of these things right now could be serious problems in my system which would make it not work. And I really don't have a handle on how to, to work with that. Um, also, you know, people talk about how Haskell is um, pure, but it also does have exceptions, which, um, yeah, I'm not gonna go there right now, but let's just say it's, 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 it's problematic, right? So if you're launching these green threads and one of them has an error, that can cause the rest of your, your system to have uh, failures, right? Unless you're actually accounting for those errors in that green thread. Now, there, there are primitives that the async package offers for that, but there are also other languages which better account and better systems which account for failure. Uh, I don't think Haskell really does that out of the box in any of these packages. Um, I, don't, I have no idea really what debugging a live system would look like uh, in this. If someone wants to teach me, that would be awesome. Um, the one other thing is uh, higher order abstractions, like the conduit package that I have is really nice, but um, there is this other thing called Cloud Haskell, which is trying to sort of be an actor system and some other things on Haskell, in Haskell, and it's a zombie, it's dead. Uh, no one works on that anymore. And so you kind of just get sort of nice abstractions, but they still aren't higher, higher order like other languages. So, sorry everyone gonna see any code. There's my other sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll say thank you to the MoonConf organizers. Uh, thank you, everyone in the audience. I uh, also want to thank Bartosh and Richard Cook. They're, they uh, had a Haskell concurrency and parallelism class in Seattle that I got to attend uh, a few times, and that was awesome. Uh, random people on the internet for the cat zombie pictures. Those are awesome. Uh, the FP com uh, complete team, they, um, they created Conduit, a bunch of Haskell tooling like stack and things that made my life much easier. HashiCore for actually building this system so that I can kind of test mine against theirs and I get to learn from them. Um, and Simon Payton Jones, because Haskell is still a lot of fun. So thank you everybody.